Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Pods of the Multiverse, an unofficial D&D podcast where four friends play D&D. We are so glad to have you back at the table for our second game. My name is Andy, and I'm our DM for our adventures in the world of Theros. Let's reintroduce my friends and the players for this game. I'm Jimmy. I play Gron, the beefy Minotaur. I'm Scala. I'm playing Andromedy, a human plot device. <laughs> I'm Jeppy. I am playing the world's bravest boy, Clix the Rogue. Uh, you guys should give yourselves a little more credit for this. You made it out of the siege alive, right? Could you imagine if we died in episode one? <laughs> Just a whole new party in episode two. <laughs> that would be interesting. We want to take a second here at the top to thank everyone who supported the launch of this show. Yeah, we're getting some subscribers on Patreon already. People are listening and downloading. Do we like the Patreons better? Or I mean, undoubtedly. Yeah, if you gave us money already, uh, we like you more than if you're just listening on Spotify. That's right. So, Well, without further ado, let's jump back into it. Let's have a recap of our first fate-filled game. We were introduced to our heroes in the Spartan-like polis of Akros, Gron, a Minotaur barbarian who was looking for their lost companion and instead was thrown in prison, Andromedy, a human oracle of Clothis, studying at the Citadel, and Clix, a Leonin rogue who just lost his mother after trying to rescue her from bondage. These three quickly found themselves in the middle of a raging siege at the infamous Faragax Bridge as a giant horde of minotaurs and other monstrous creatures began bearing down on the bridge and the polis's heavily fortified walls. The party escaped the siege, though not before Gron encountered and then fled from his former war chief, Hargot, and Clix was persuaded by the god of deception himself to steal from a vacant merchant stand amid the chaos. Now united by a thread of fate and visions of various events yet to transpire, the party make for the citadel, to search for answers to these omens. So, you're all standing around a smith's shop along the Aroan Way. What do you do next? I mean, I just start walking towards the Citadel, because I've, I've already made that clear that that's what I think we should do, so I'm going to lead the way yonder. I follow. Clicks follows. Okay, you begin traveling along the Aroan Way, and you begin to see more and more architecture within the polis proper, which is formidable, spare and militaristic, thick with sharp angular shapes, and you see various statues of gods and heroes of gods dotting the streets that split off from the main thoroughfare. Uh, you also see red tiled roofs soaring over the sandstone columns and various small holy sites dedicated to the various gods, which are quite commonplace throughout. Andromedy, why don't you go ahead and give me a perception check as you begin leading the party? Sure. 17. Okay. You can see as you're traveling that your pace seems leisurely compared to the few other people that you see scattering about various houses and other buildings. It seems that the panic near the walls of which you just fled from has begun spilling over into the majority of Akros, and people are basically fleeing as far away from the outer walls as they can get. So you continue along, and you eventually come to the place that you assume all of these people are escaping to. You're now looking upon the Temple of Triumph, the formal title of what is otherwise known as the Colosseum at Akros. It marks the polis's geographic and spiritual center. Andromedy or Clix, go ahead and give me history checks. That's only an eight. I don't remember much about Eroan history. Ten. So either one of you know the gist. It marks the polis's geographic and spiritual center, and it's known to host Theros's quote-unquote greatest sporting event, the Eroan Games. It's also a space that just kind of generally is used for training and other lesser events for the various athletes and warriors of Akros. So you're coming up on this enormous coliseum, and you see crowds of people beginning to gather around its entrances and fill the space as a seeming camp is being hastily erected on its grounds. What do you all do? 
Can we still see the Citadel from where we are? You can. The Colosseum is like the halfway point along this major thoroughfare. And then on the other side of it, it continues up towards the Citadel. Do I know of another way up and around to avoid this sort of crowd? Or is this kind of the only way through? Go ahead and give me a insight or survival check. Eh, uh, a middling 11 insight. Uh, you imagine you could get off the main road and kind of take some back alleys around, but the easiest way is to go directly through the Colosseum and, and back out the other side. Then I suppose I get in line. Do the other two follow? We do. I've been standing really close to Andromeda this whole time because I don't want to be mistaken for one of the dangerous Minotaurs. One of the dangerous Minotaurs. <laughs> yeah, you're no danger to anybody. Absolutely. I'm not dangerous at all. No. <laughs> Very friendly, nice man. <laughs> Just a big, beefy body that's friendly to one and all. That's right. <laughs> this is my walking mall the size of a man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Keeps me stable on these rough grounds here in Akros. As you approach the crowds, Gron, you do in fact get some eyes immediately drawn towards you. They just seem to kind of stay out of the way. What are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see these people staring at you. And one kind of peasant-looking man looks up at you and goes, what, what are you doing here? What do you want from us? We are fleeing the battle, the same as the rest of you. You you were there? You saw the fight? What happened? It was bloody chaos. We were lucky to escape with our lives. There's some uh, dangerous minotaurs out there. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> dangerous? <laughs> what do you mean? Are you not? Are you? Are you not one of them? He kind of... It's a little closer, hesitantly, as he says this. What do you mean, one of them? I mean... Uh-oh. Look at you. <laughs> what about me? Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> I step up on him. He looks at himself quizzically as you step up on him, and another figure kind of steps forward from the crowd and says, Whoa, whoa, we don't need any trouble here. Friend Minotaur, my name is Thallus, and you don't look like any savage that I've ever seen out in the deserts. Thank you. He turns to... <laughs> it's kind of a shitty thing to say, isn't it? Um, he, he turns to this other, this other guy and kind of puts a hand on his shoulder and says, Not all minotaurs are like the beasts out there that wish us all dead. No, not all of you. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I put a hand on Gron's shoulder with perhaps a look of, When you're in a hole, stop digging. The two just kind of turn around, and Andromedy, you can hear one of them whispering, Man, that, that Minotaur was really weird, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, just leave him alone. And the line continues moving, as awkward conversations are had by all. Clix looks back at Gron and says, You really don't know how to keep a low profile, do you? Look at me. He turns to Andromedy. This? This isn't a liability for us? Um... Andromedy shrugs. Trust in the path that fate has laid before you. Oh my god. Clicks just, you know, shakes his head and kind of recedes back into his robe. Speaking of the path that fate has laid before me, it occurs to me that I don't know your names. Uh, Gron. My name's Clicks. And I am Andromedy. It is good to be properly acquainted. Sure. As you make brief introductions amongst one another, you can see the line quickly moving as the crowds are ushered into the Colosseum proper. Perhaps a small notion of kleptomania creeps into Click's mind as you are drawn into this crowd and through the gates of the Colosseum. The soldiers at the gates immediately notice Gron, draw their gladius, and point them towards the three of you. This is your only warning. We don't want any trouble here. People are just trying to find safety. Yes, we are people just trying to find safety. Please let us pass. No trouble here. Give me a persuasion check. Fifteen persuasion. Okay. They seem mostly persuaded. They put their swords down. As you enter, you can all plainly see the road continue on the other side of this Colosseum. About halfway up either side of the Colosseum's interior, you see these large set of stairs that lead up to enormous braziers, which are currently unlit, and statues of Erois in various poses encircling them. 
Gran, as you look upon him, go ahead and give me a religion check. 17. Okay. You notice that Erois is a centaur, but unlike most centaurs, the lower half of his body is not that of a horse, it is actually that of a bull. This thought enters your mind as you look upon the statues in various heroic poses of athleticism and combat that the duality of Mogus and Erois go much farther than just being brothers who feud and war that they are more literally connected and more physically embodied in this visage. And that kind of sparks in your mind as you look. Huh. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) I think all that. Deep thought. All of that compelling thought simply transcribed as... Uh... (laughs) (laughs) It's a reasonable grunt. Always a reasonable grunt. You are free to pass through the Colosseum, and the Eroan Way begins to wind through denser parts of Akros, where modest buildings give way to grander structures of business, military, and of course, religion. Ultimately, the way leads to the high inner walls, which divide the rest of the polis from the Colophon within. The many-tiered fortress and the seat of power for all of Akros, both politically and spiritually. As you approach, you can plainly see a garrison of hoplites, the most elite Akroan warriors, guarding the heavily closed and fortified doors. I think we can take them. I don't believe we will have to. Well, we wouldn't have to if we could just sneak by, and Clix gives kind of a side eye over to Gron. There should be no need for that. I work here. Here? Well, in the Citadel. Figures. Yeah, seems about right. Yes, I am an oracle. (laughs) I work in the temple. We get it. We get it. Just get us in and let's get on with this. Very well. And I'll head to the doors. The roll I made was a perception check to see if these very well-trained hoplites see the beefy minotaur approaching, and they did see. So now you have a group of warriors, maybe a half dozen or so, you can't really tell yet, all drawing swords and spears as the three of you approach. What do we do? I start to reach for my mom. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do let that. Me, let me talk to them. I... I work here. They should let me through. I am on the gods' business. I approach this column of hoplites. Should I go with you? Yes, you're coming with me anyhow. Okay. You approach, and a woman immediately shouts out as you are still pretty far away. Don't come any closer. The colophon is on lockdown. No one gets in. I'll stay where I am. I'll raise my arms, sort of innocently. I also raise my arms, sort of innocently. Clix does not. You see a war priest of Erois, a human woman in hoplite gear, very tan skin and short black hair, and steel blue-gray eyes behind her centurion's helm. As she lowers her spear, she says, We are on direct orders from Arissa and Asrius themselves. I'm sorry, we cannot let you in. Can you send a message to them? She looks at you a little puzzled. What? What do you want? My name is Andromedy. I am the Oracle of Clothis. I have been staying in your temple. Clothis has brought myself and these two individuals together, and I seek guidance from the other oracles to know and interpret why fate has brought us together. If you could let them know that I seek their guidance, perhaps they will understand and let us pass. As you're telling her this, you can see a very clear look of confusion as she says, Clothis? The god of destiny herself. No, that... that can't be, I'm afraid. (sighs) She looks obviously confused. Go ahead and give me a insight check. Oh, whatever she's feeling, I'm not reading it, because that's in that one. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'm sure she wants me to come right in. (laughs) She... she goes on. I'm sorry, but no one is allowed to enter until the siege has been halted. If you believe it is the will of the gods for you to reach the citadel or any of those inside. I'm afraid you're mistaken. We have a job to do just as much as I'm sure you do as well. You will have to seek guidance elsewhere. I'm sorry. The three of you see over the top of these walls 
two figures flying overhead. Andromeda, you look up and you see Polymede is one of them. She is flying with clouds and lightning swirling around her form. And the other you see, a figure that maybe you've only seen a few times, but this is Arissa, Eroes' hand, the High Oracle of the Citadel, a large centaur with spectral giant eagle's wings allowing him to fly, the two of them now directly overhead of you. You can see that they're going towards the siege as Polymede looks down directly at you. I sort of eye this, scrunch my face up for a second in, not confusion, but like disappointment, like, ah, ah. and then I look back at my companions and I say, it appears that my fellow oracles are preoccupied with the defense of the city. I do not believe they will be of much help, and I do not believe that the speaker for Heliod will look kindly on my task. I shall have to ponder this a moment. I don't understand most things you say. You can see as they are flying overhead that Polymede is still looking directly at you, even though now she's a little, little farther. But you see all the hoplites around these gates saluting these two as they fly overhead. Sure, I'll throw a salute as well. What could it hurt? Andromedy, go ahead and give me a quick persuasion check. 14. Okay. In your mind, you hear the voice of Polymede, a faint rolling of thunder echoing with her words as she says, I fear we fly in the face of great trouble this day. I know not what your god has shown you, but mine has shown me horror. I cannot say how long this siege will last, but I fear that Eroes is on his back feet. You, young one, I suggest you return to your former masters. They may be of more help than I this day. Give me insight on that. Uh, dirty 20. You might immediately kind of wince when she says the phrase former masters, because you immediately know that it means the flame speakers. I wave my hand in front of Andromeda's face. As you say, Sophistes, please be safe. And then I will turn back to Ron and offer some sort of like deferential nod of apology. Uh, forgive me, another oracle was sending me a message. It appears we will find no answers here. <sighs> but I do know of another place. Where next? It is a treacherous journey uh -huh. into the mountains. Uh -huh. I look at clicks and say, Do you ever get the feeling they're making this up? <laughs> I'm losing confidence in you with every step we take, preacher. First of all, not a preacher. I'm an oracle. I do not interpret the words of the gods, I relay them. Important theological distinction. I understand that your kind do not pay the gods proper homage, but... Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it is relevant. And second, as I said, we know what we are meant to know to do what we are meant to do. I was meant to come here to receive a message from Polymede, and now I am meant to take you to the Flame Speakers. I uh, didn't mean to offend with my statement. Less familiar to you, I'm sure, uh, is some custom we have in Miaska. On occasions such as this, we like to bury the hatchet, so to speak. And with that, clicks kind of gives Andromedy a hug. When I go to hug Andromedy, I will attempt to steal uh, their book. How did I not see this coming? Wild. Some wild shit here. Clicks, go ahead and give me a sleight of hand. 17. Andromeda, I assume your passive perception is lower than that? Yeah, no, I don't I don't notice this going on. Um, I, I return the hug. I'm a hugger. I roll my eyes. Clicks, you go to find the book on Andromeda's person, and you do, and you, in your very practiced way, try to lift it and it gets to a certain point and andromedy you immediately feel a tug at your waist there's something up clicks backs away again my apologies <laughs> you fuck no apology necessary thief but i would like you to understand <laughs> that i am not here as your adversary i'm here as your guide and the wisdom and knowledge in this book will help me guide you hell of a guidebook Clicks as you say that, and roll your eyes, you hear the familiar voice of the god of deception enter your mind and say, 
<laughs> nice, try. nice try. What do the three of you do now? Which way out of the city leads to the shrines of Perforos? You would know that the eastern gates are very close by, and that out those gates lead to the various trails and paths that enter the Katachthan Mountains. Katachthan? Katach... Katachthan? Katachthan. 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 All right, I'm starting walking that way. I follow. Um, as we walk, Gron, I noticed you had a strange orb on you. Do you mind if I have a look at it? It reminded me of a of a divination focus. Oh, uh, what? No. I don't care. Here. <laughs> okay. I'll just take it and put it uh, in one of my bags for now. And when I have some time to do some ritual casting, I'll want to do some of that with the orb. Do you think it's worth anything? Perhaps. But its true value may be in its magical properties, if it has any. Everything's true value is in gold. He just gets edgier and edgier, Jesus. He says it kind of quietly, probably loud enough so everyone can hear, but he's definitely saying it to himself. Almost reminding himself of that one truth that he knows. I follow one truth. Gold! <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, man, you just gotta follow your truth. <laughs> My truth is looting. There I go again, looting. <laughs> My truth is looting. Oh, that reminds me. I take out my loot and start strumming. Does Gron actually have a loot? No, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was serious for a second. For a second. No. Um, <laughs> no. Dr uh, Gron actually has drum proficiency. We might just happen upon an instrument one day, a drum, and he'll uh, he'll wow you with his virtuosity. Play a polyrhythm. Mm, one can only hope. You quickly find the eastern gates of Akros. Oddly unguarded, if anybody wants to roll insight or perception on that. So this is where I got my nat 20 for the session on this insight check. <laughs> okay. On a nat 20, you come upon this scene and your immediate thought is that all of the guards who were attending this gate went to help defend the siege at the western gate. You think for a second that that's perfectly reasonable until you realize that they left these gates open. The thought crosses your mind just as quickly that that seems extremely odd. What's wrong? These gates are open and unguarded. It would make sense if they had sealed them before they were to join the defense of the city, but we should seal these gates on our way out and be on our guard. All right. What do you think's ahead? No idea. This guide keeps getting better and better. Clicks and Andromedy, why don't you go ahead and give me perception checks? Ten. Six. You move towards the gates and begin closing them. They are very similar to the Western gates, if not maybe only half the size. I've, uh, I've done this before. It works very similarly to a big door. <laughs> <laughs> Gron just wanted to feel smart. Man, Gron's trying. Do you know how to operate doors? Yeah. I didn't see a door until I was 14 years old. Where did you grow up? Oh. <laughs> Gron has a really graphic flashback. To? The wastelands where he, just the brutality raised him more than anything else. He goes dead-eyed. Clicks in Andromeda, you both see Gron go into a blank stare for a moment. When suddenly, I need all three of you to make dexterity saving throws, please. Five. Five also. Which ain't good for a fucking rogue. Twelve. Oh shit. Gron, as you are kind of blankly staring out through the gates, as the three of you have approached, you see a volley of arrows shoot in your direction from either side of the gate. You are able to dodge out of the way of this volley, avoiding the fray. However, Clicks and Andromedy take 11 piercing damage. Jesus. Arrow volley. You gonna chill with that? I rolled very high. <laughs> and everybody, let's go ahead and roll initiative. Uh, eight. 17. Nine. 
as these arrows streak past, some of them striking in deep, piercing wounds, you can hear voices of a handful of people on the other side of walls saying, I knew this trap would work. Those guards leaving the gate unattended. I knew we'd run into somebody trying to get away from this mess. Up first, you see a bandit-looking human come out with a bow lowered and holding a dagger in hand, approach and strike out at Clix, who managed to dodge the arrow volley. Does a 14 hit you, Clix? Yes. The dagger pierces into your side as he lunges forward towards you for three piercing damage. And it is your turn. You see this one figure in front of you, this robed human, scruffy, short, scraggly beard, and long in the tooth, and you assume a few others that are still hidden behind the walls. I guess I'm just going to attack. Is a 15 hit? Yes, it does. Or um, you slash out at this figure, and you can hear someone from behind the walls yell, The Doris, watch out! As this figure is injured. Going to use bonus action to uh, offhand attack. Eight. That will miss. Clicks connecting with the first swing, but missing with the second. We go to Andromedy. I am just going to try and reach out and touch the bandit in front of me with a touch attack. A 21 hits, I presume. Absolutely. He takes six lightning damage and can't take reactions. What does Andromedy's shock and grasp look like? Andromedy would again start encanting from the book, but this is a cantrip, so it doesn't take any threads. Instead, the book starts to sort of crackle with a red-tinged electrical energy. It courses into the hand that is delivering the spell, and they just reach out and let that electricity be channeled from their body into their targets. As you do this, you can see the figure in front of you is very injured, kind of wretches back a bit. What? Who the fuck are you? and coughs up a little bit of blood. They are very bloodied. I'm also going to use some movement to try and just get away from this conflict in melee. If I can, like, start heading either down the road or somewhere where I can, like, not be so readily jumped. Great. So you try and back away, and this guy... Can't take reactions. Can't take reactions. Fuck you. <laughs> awesome. So you, you back away from this scene, trying to get out of harm's way successfully and unimpeded whatsoever. As we go to Gron. I'm going to charge directly at this guy with my maul and just hit him as hard as I can. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> That's the old Gron way. That's a crit. Uh-oh. 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 That's 19 bludgeoning damage. Kron, go ahead and paint a picture as you absolutely destroy this person who once had a life but no longer does. Yeah, I just snap right out of my little daydream that I was having. I see my friends are in danger, instinctively grab my maul and heave it up over my head and let it fall upon this frail figure and he crumples down into a pile of body parts. You called us your friends. Oh. First of all, very cute. <laughs> Second of all, in his dying breath, a crumpled former humanoid shape, he simply says, oh, We were just trying to make a buck. And he is no more. This is completely the wrong way to go about breeding deer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no! That's such a bad joke! <laughs> that's such a bad joke! The other two, looking absolutely terrified at this scene, jump up from where they were hidden and go, Oh shit! What's a fucking Minotaur doing all the way over here? I don't appreciate the implication. And they are going to decide whether or not they want to just run away. One of them draws their longbow again and is going to shoot at you, perhaps unwisely, with... A 13, which I think misses. <laughs> I move my head out of the way. Yeah, you like anime style, tilt your neck so that the arrow goes f like flying past where your head just was. This cowering figure standing up out of the bushes is going to try and now hide after making a grave mistake. 
only rolling a six. You can see them try and hide down in the bushes, and the bushes now shifting around with their form cowering inside. The other one is going to try and run away from you. You can see them beginning to flee this scene. They're maybe about 20 feet away from you at this point. And we go back to clicks. Am I near anywhere where I can hide? You look around quickly and see the walls. You see the bush that one of the bandits fled from. And, of course, the gates themselves, which you could reasonably hide behind the easiest. I'll hide behind whatever's easiest. I'll just uh, hide. Go ahead and give me a stealth check. 13. I want to attack the one in the bush, and I would like to attack while hidden and then do a sneak attack as well. They do not see you. You get sneak attack on this. 17. That'll definitely hit. It's a four for the main attack, and then with the sneak attack, five total. You should add your dexterity as well. I did. That is, I rolled two ones. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Yikes. So that's three ones in a row. Clicks, trying his best to be edgy, but just can't quite commit. I love the idea that he's all talk and then runs away and can't fight for shit. (laughs) Can't fight for shit. That's great. Really setting a precedent for this character. You hear a yelp from the bush as you fire your short bow, where this person is plainly doing a bad job hiding. And we go to Andromeda. I point at the one poorly hidden in the bush. You cannot hide from destiny. And open my book again. This time, the threads pour out and take the shape of three uh, white arrows that are drawn by a single string unerringly towards this person hiding in the bush. And they take 13 points of force damage as these three magic missiles uh, strike them. Oh my god. So, Andromedy, I imagine that you would like to add a little addendum that would be forming a sort of picture as you end the life of this cowering bandit with your magic missiles. These three silk arrows are drawn by these thin strings, one into one eye, one into the other, and the third through the ribs directly into their heart. Surprisingly savage, as you see the body of this bandit slump out of the bush in front of you their life now void and we go to ground Ugh, that's gross i say as i'm standing over this pile of body parts <laughs> <laughs> you have one fleeing away from the three of you maybe about 20 25 feet away going into the wilderness <laughs> that face is saying well <laughs> i got these horns and they they do be charging <laughs> You hear him screaming for his life as he's trying to get away from this scene as fast as possible. So I fix my eyes on this person who's running away, and I start to kind of paw at the ground like a bull does. (laughs) Oh no. Yeah? Okay. (laughs) And then I remember that I'm better than that. Not every encounter has to end with death. I take a deep breath and hold my ground. Give me a religion check. Six. You just faintly feel a calm presence, almost like a hand on your shoulder, uh, affirming this choice um, faintly before it disappears. And we exit initiative, unless (laughs) Clix wants to chase after this guy. No, Clix is absolutely going to check the bodies for stuff, though. Okay, so we exit initiative... And immediately, Clix goes to the nearest corpse. Go ahead and give me a investigation check. 25. Lovely. Awesome. What did I find? The one which was shocking grasped and then mauled to death has (laughs) what was once maybe a, a pretty nice breastplate, but is now severely dented on their person as well as a pouch full of 10 gold. Taking it. On the nat 20, I'll also just give you what the other bandit had, which was a longbow with a quiver of 20 common arrows, and then a small case which contains five very ornately and intricately designed arrowheads. Clicks, you see all of this. What do you do? Take it. Straightforward. Nice. Uh, Andromedy and Gron, you see clicks rifling through the bodies. 
Clix reminds the dungeon master that it wasn't just shocking grasp and the mall, but he also did damage of his own. Thank you very much. What was it? Four damage, four whole damage. It's either four or five. I... Yeah. I have no objection to the looting of the dead. I assume, unless otherwise, uh, that you close the gates and make your way into the mountains. Would I know? how like long of a journey this is i've only probably made it like twice in my life and i don't think i've ever gone like directly there andromedy go ahead and make either a history or survival check for me and i'll say since you were there you can make this with advantage oh uh, that history check's going to be a 21. Okay. You remember the residents of the Flame Speakers, specifically Volkos, your former mentor, pretty vividly. And uh, it was often referred to as a place called the Monastery Atop the Mountain. And you would remember that the journey from there to Akros was about two days. But the hiking, which for you on your way to Akros was all downhill, uh, even then, was pretty treacherous. I will relay that information to the group, say we should probably find a good place to make camp tonight, and then most of our day tomorrow will be spent in travel. Okay. Gran takes a deep breath and says, Ah, oh, it's good to be back out here. Those walls were creeping me out. Clix takes a few nervous looks around. He's never really spent a lot of time outside of uh, cities, so this is all a little jarring to him, uh, but keeps to himself and keeps quiet. As the three of you leave the walls of Akros, journeying east, the road into the mountains is very plainly not an easy one in front of you. Immediately upon exiting, you find yourselves winding up steep mountain passes, rocky switchback paths cutting a trail into the wilderness. Sparse trees and brush cling to the mountainsides like moss on a rock, and billowing clouds obscure the frigid mountaintop landscapes to the far beyond. And now we are entering something of a skill challenge. And so as you make this journey into the mountaintops in search of the flame speakers, the three of you will be rolling skill checks of a skill that you are proficient in and basically describing how you're using that skill to aid the party's travel through the mountains. And depending on how much I like the description and how well you roll, that will determine how easy your travel is and whether or not you find any other obstacles or encounters along the way. It is also mid-afternoon at this point. I'll say Gron, or even Andromedy, you would guess that maybe you had a couple hours worth of travel if you wanted to get any done now before trying to make camp somewhere. Uh, so who wants to go first as you set out into the wilderness? All right. Fuck. Add a d4 to your roll because fate guides you. Well, I guide you and fate guides me. That's a 6, plus a 2 on the d4, plus 7 to athletics. When I feel that my companions are getting tired, I am going to pick them up and carry them under my arm. Oh man. Uh, which you can just do, because you have fucking 20 strength. Yeah. Okay, so that's a very good roll, and starting out, very strong, Gron uh, really keeping the group at a very steady and even pace as you begin hiking these mountain trails. Indeed, the beefy minotaur body lending much aid to those perhaps tiring more quickly than others. The beads of sweat on my bulging muscles glisten in the sun. <laughs> Do they? Or, or <laughs> you would think that it would be obscured by a lot of, like, fur. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, good point. I, wa I no, I want it to be canon. I'm <laughs> loving that, like, we're establishing Gron as this Liam Neeson character, but who also has, like, firefighter calendar kind of <laughs> sex appeal. <laughs> yes. If there's ever any fan God art damn it. We're, ever. We're, now, you've, now you've gone and attracted the furries. I mean, That's yeah. right. Just imagine a bullhead on, like, the rock's body. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I mean, yeah, twenty strength. That's about. That's about right. That is. Uh, that is objectively accurate. I would say. Um, 
I don't mean to be rude, but I imagine they didn't let you bathe if you were a prisoner. What? Uh, bathe? What do you mean? <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, is the process of, you know, being submerged in, in water or sometimes in a in a hot room with steam, um, it, it's supposed to have a cleansing effect. It's something you're supposed to do every once every couple of years. Every couple of years? I go, like, swimming. Oh, yes, similar to swimming. No, I, they didn't let me swim as a prisoner. Was that your question? You know, something like that. I just, when you picked me up, there was, um, there was an unmistakable scent. And Andromedy and Gron having this conversation as Andromedy is literally under Gron's arm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and being leisurely carried by this minotaur. I said, you know, I insinuated that Clix doesn't bathe often. And I stand by that because he does live in the sewers. But, like, do Leonin lick themselves like cats do to take a bath? I'd say definitely yes. Fuck, okay. Yeah. Then, then never mind. Then Clix takes baths. Yeah. Damn it. But you also <laughs> described Clix as having matted fur in the first. I did. You know what? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But but all that was, like, forgetting that cats just lick their bodies <laughs> to clean themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I stand by it. But all right, no, I'm 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 walking that I'm walking this through a little bit more. He was abandoned at birth. No one taught him how to do that. Okay. So he bathes like humans, but he doesn't do it often because he lives in the sewers. Clicks is a fucking mess is what I'm getting at. I think living in the sewers is a good enough reason to have <laughs> matted fur <laughs> and i also think that that's still like the idea of like bathing yourself like a cat would be at least like remotely instinctual mm. whether or not clicks <laughs> kind of gives into those kinds of instincts in the same way that i guess clicks is just giving into that instinct of cats just wanting to have things <laughs> <laughs> yes. he has a little cat hammock and he just takes all the shit puts it in there i guess uh clicks is dirty I, that's I, that, those are the character details i'm trying to dive into he's okay. just a filthy garbage <laughs> all right anyway <laughs> the three of you do notice the sun beginning to quickly set i have dark vision and i had planned to roll my skill for investigation to make sure there are no traps okay i feel like that might be useful if we want to make more headway at night it's up to you guys. Are you going to make another check or are you going to make camp? I'd like to make camp. I'm in the camp camp too. Yeah, I grew up in the wasteland. I know that night is dangerous. Do you say that in character? We should make camp. Have a problem seeing at night? Yes. Yes. Some of the party also kind of injured <laughs> compared to others. Oh yeah, that's me. Fine, we can make camp. You decide to make camp and end to a very long and fate-filled day. The evening sky gives way to a clear night where you can see an awe-inspiring view of Nyx itself. The brilliant constellations and bright celestial clouds, the size of mountains and oceans, moving about depicting endless thoughts and miracles and conflicts of the gods as they play out across the sky. With Nyx above, you begin to make camp, and for the three of you, what exactly does that look like? I would definitely start gathering materials to make a fire. Andromedy just finds sort of a quiet place to sit under whatever sort of clearing or outcropping we've decided to rest at. I lay out sort of a, a blanket and I lay my book in front of me and I withdraw uh, the orb that Gron had given me. I sort of place it in front of the book and I begin sort of a long process of intonations and chanting for about 10 minutes as I attempt to identify this object. Okay, we'll come back to that. Clix, what are you doing? Clix is going to go and uh, just find a larger branch on the tree to just perch up on and, and rest alone. However, when, if and when Gron gets the fire lit, eventually Clix will likely fall to their baser cat instincts and do a little cat loaf next to the fire to go to sleep. Cool. But not near Gron. Of course, never. No. Awesome. So <laughs> as Clix climbs a nearby tree to rest, Gron begins preparing a small fire. Andromedy, you cast Identify. This item is sort of modified drift globe. It has all of the capabilities of that item, but it can also act 
as a focus for the purposes of divination spells. It doesn't grant you any, which makes the distinction between that and the orb of scrying. So let's say that this is a diviner's drift globe. Very good. Gron makes a pile of like sticks and leaves and then starts searching his body for something to light the fire with and realizes he doesn't have any of his usual equipment with him. Wizard, make fire. (laughs) They have some tinder for burning incense um, if they need to in their rituals. I throw a bit of the tinder under the the wood that Kron has sort of collected and I sort of say make fire back at him in Minotaur and I throw a little firebolt into the pit. Nice. Alright. I'll take first watch. Andromedy, second watch. As you say. And uh, I'll take uh, third watch too. I don't think Clix is going to be any use to us. Clix does like a stretch and gets comfortable and hunkers back down to sleep. What should I look out for? I've lived something of a cloistered life as an oracle. I haven't spent much time out in the wilds like this. Uh, anything that uh, looks like it's going to hurt us, that's about it. I will trust Clothis to guide us in this. Mm. <laughs> Andromedy will kind of ignore this, give Scully a little pat on their shoulder, and kind of just retire to where they would sort of laid their blanket to go to sleep. Okay. And Gron begins his first watch. Go ahead and roll me a perception check. Six. Your watch seems clear enough. You don't really see anything hostile or particularly suspicious about the immediate vicinity of your small camp. You definitely see some pretty brilliant displays in Nyx, however. Even on that six, you can very plainly see the visages of... Mogus and Rois battling over the skies of Akros. I noticed that the images in the skies of Nyx are more prominent than they are kind of just out in the wastelands, and I'm transfixed with what's going on up there. Yeah, for sure. Your watch goes by without any any real hindrance, as I said, from the wilderness around you. Is there anything that you do during your watch? Can I see Akros from where I am? With that perception check, you can't necessarily see it, you know, above the tree lines or any of the mountain cliffs edges that you guys have begun to scale. Occasionally, you can hear what sounds like more of these kind of explosive blasts that were being set off from the various boulders and other, you know, hurled debris and objects from from the horde as they mounted their attack, and that would be about it. I look back in the direction of Akros, which has sort of faded into the wilderness, and I say, don't worry, I'll be back for you. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, Go ahead and give me another, another religion check. Four. Bummer. (laughs) <laughs> that's it <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's it alright I stand there expectantly and nothing happens I'll say this you you feel the same presence that you had felt after letting the bandit flee into the wilderness and you get the sense that someone is trying to reach out to you but just as quickly as you get that feeling again you feel it lose its grasp over you and slip away. I raise one eyebrow. That's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Unless there's anything else, we will go to Andromedy. Andromedy will stir awake. They will sort of prop themselves up comfortably. They will turn again to Scully, the moth sitting on their shoulder. They will say, Come, little friend, let me have use of your eyes. And they will lean back against this side of the mountain, let the white sort of ring around their pupils engulf their whole eye, and the moth will sort of take off up about 50 or so feet in the air and start making lazy circles around the camp as I see through Scully's eyes. Awesome. Go ahead and roll perception with advantage. That is going to be a 22 perception. You notice a lot. 
Most striking, being similarly to Gron, you see Erois and Mogus battling over the skies of Akros. But on your roll, it looks as though Mogus may have a very clear, strong upper hand in this battle, as it is depicted as Erois seems to be struggling to hold his brother at bay. You also see, in the direction that you are heading, the visage of the constellations of Perforos himself over the top of the highest mountains appears to be working at his forge. Lastly, on a 22, as Scully looks in all directions from above the wilderness in which you are resting, far in the distance, the very edge of the horizon of this world, you see a faint, hooded figure made of stardust. What do you do? I contemplate these images and nicks and sort of consider if perhaps there's any significance to me and what we're doing. But otherwise, if there doesn't appear to be any immediate danger, I just spend my time sort of meditatively during this watch. As you try and ponder these visages, go ahead and give me a religion check. Only an 11. Okay. I mean, obviously the, the battle being played out is striking and foreboding. On an 11, I think even Andromedy would consider the inherent nature of the balance that the twin war gods have at each other and what this seeming imbalance is beginning to unfold and, and what that could mean. Other than that, not much else. You are certainly entering the domain of Perforos. Makes sense that you would see him at work in the sky. Other than that, your watch is clear. Clix gets up, circles around, makes a couple biscuits, goes back to bed. Oh my god, he makes face. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <clears throat> the rest of the evening watches are clear as the next day dawns, and you all gain the benefits of a long rest. So on this, the second day, or the first full day, of your journey towards the Flame Speakers, uh, who would like to start this leg of the skill challenge? I'll take it. Andromedy saw that figure of Perforos in the sky at night and has recalled that there are, you know, various shrines along this path sort of dedicated to Perforos. So they're going to sort of try and stop at each one, offer a small prayer and an offering, and just implore Perforos for his aid in, in our safe conveyance. I'm going to roll religion for that. <laughs> oh, God. Oh uh, I rolled the same number on the d4 as I did on the d20. Uh-oh. <laughs> 2 and 2 plus 5 is 9. It's been a while since I've done okay. these rituals. I'm messing up some of the words and whatnot. Sure, I imagine <laughs> so. Clicks rolls his eyes as he sees Andromedy stumble while reading a book. You, you step off the beaten path, or as beaten as this winding mountain pass uh, could possibly be to go to pay homage at one of these small shrines. And I'm going to need you to roll a d8 for me. Six. Okay. And now I need you to roll me two d4, please. Uh, one and one. Okay. You're encanting these prayers, and you see two Amphisbena, so four snake heads peering back up at you from tucked within this small shrine, which you quickly notice are each connected to two large snakes. And they lash out at you with their four heads. Two of them missing completely as you stagger back, but two more biting into you as you are surprised. One of them was a two. You, you spoke incorrectly. I replace it with one of my portent die for the day. Of course you do. <laughs> so one hits you for six piercing damage and four poison damage. Clicks and Gron, you see Andromedy stagger back as these large snakes attack their form. Everybody go ahead and roll some initiative quick. Uh, natural 20 for uh, 21. 14. Dirty five. A filthy, filthy five. Disgusting five. Okay. Andromeda, you're up first. 
All right. I will sort of cringe as this snake recoils its fangs out of me, and I will attempt to hit it with a melee touch attack. Ooh. I don't think a 12 will hit. A 12 will just miss. Okay. Then I will, uh, I suppose, stay where I am because I don't want to eat a bunch of AOOs. All right. These snakes coil back their heads once more and strike out towards Andromedy again. I am so sorry. No, you're not. Here's four more bite attacks. We've got four on the dice, an 18 plus six, which will hit, a two on the dice, and a 12 plus six, which will also hit. That's nine more damage and three more damage as these large snake fangs dig into your arms as you still try to fight them off. Your companions seemingly not having the quickest reaction to these snakes. But we go to Grom. I'm going to run up and recklessly attack it. Go for it. That is going to be 16 to hit. That'll still hit. Okay. 11 bludgeoning damage. Awesome. That is exactly how much health one of them has. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you slam down into one of the bodies of these large snakes, their two heads still burrowed into the arms of Andromedy, and you crush it, smashing into the ground once the Amphisbana defeated. Anything else? No. Okay. I only have a bonus action if I don't kill a target, which has never happened. <laughs> it's a nice problem to have. Hey, it's not bad. Uh, that's clicks. Uh, I would like to hide and attack and sneak attack. Is that a possibility given my surroundings? It is. I will also remind you that if you can engage with an enemy that's already engaged in combat with an ally, you'll get sneak attack anyways. You won't even need to hide. If Gron wouldn't fucking kill everything in one turn. Well, the other one is still, like, attacking Andromedy. Oh, okay. I thought that's the one he killed. There are four heads for two bodies, yeah. So, yeah, there's still a whole one alive. Okay, I'm gonna go fuck with that one and attack it and then sneak attack it. Okay. Cool. Advantage... Doesn't matter, because I presume that a 21 hits. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so that's eight for the attack and sneak attack. Okay. You slash into this creature and really do a number with the first attack. Go ahead. Uh, does an 11 hit? 11 misses. Shit. Missing with the offhand, grazing off of the tough snake skin of this large snake. But the first attack doing some some good damage. Clicks hisses. Oh yeah, what's that sound like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought so. I fucking All thought right, no, so. No, no. You're gonna hold to it. it. Uh, the well, it's not a rattlesnake, so it doesn't do anything. <laughs> I'm glad that was worth it. <laughs> it's a good use of time. <laughs> uh, no. I, do snakes make noise other than? They also hiss. Do they? Yeah, they they okay. hiss too. Yeah, so here we go. Uh, you hiss, and one of the snake heads <laughs> detaches itself from uh, Andromedy and hisses back. I'm sure that was great audio, but uh, it's Andromedy's turn. All right, uh, I'm going to try and once again lay a shocking grasp on one of these on this last remaining snake. Nope, an eleven won't hit. An eleven total does not hit, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Hiss at it; it helps. No. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, I'm kind of stuck here. Okay, how are you looking, Andromedy? Three hit points. Great. Um, here's a here's a little point of order. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm not gonna. Be no, no, salty. go ahead, because I was just gonna say. If you're gonna surprise attack someone, at least allow them a perception check first. It's not. Oh, you're surprised. Here's four things attacking you with advantage. Like. Either way, I was going to say that they're not going to attack you. They're going to attack Clicks because Clicks hissed at them. So <laughs> they're going to attack Clicks. But Clicks didn't. Who's Clicks it? didn't d debate rules with the DM. Yeah, you also attacked snakes. So oh, Andromedy whiffed, and you didn't. So it's going after you. Uh, here's fair. two attacks. That's a 12 total, which I believe miss. Miss. And a 17 total, which will hit. Yeah. Four, three piercing damage, and six poison damage uh, as the snake heads 
lash into you, one of them finding purchase. We go to Grom. I'm going to hit that snake head. Hell yeah. <laughs> recklessly. Okay. It's a 19 to hit. Absolutely. Mm, that's going to be 12 bludgeoning damage. All right. Gron, kill stealing from clicks. Go ahead and paint a picture as you destroy this second Amphisbana. I swing my maul at it recklessly and smash it right on the head and drive it into the ground. <laughs> Hell yeah. A quick end to these Amphisbana who have made this shrine their home. Uh, we exit initiative, and that skill challenge concludes... Great, I'm going to immediately, like, cure wounds myself. Ooh, I get a nice 10 back there. You see uh, Andromedy go to cure a bit of their snake bites. So with two out of the way, we have one remaining. Clicks, what do you do? I am going to roll for investigation to make sure that we do not come across any more bullshit snake traps on our route. That sounds perfectly reasonable. Dirty 20 all in. Okay, nice. So you are keeping a very watchful eye out as you investigate the path ahead, as you investigate any of the other shrines that uh, Andromedy may or may not now want to pay homage at. The wilderness around you, and you encounter little uh, difficulty. You are able to steer the party away from any loose rock faces that the path may happen to travel near as well as any errant sounds of hostile beasts or anything that may be close by in the various brush and other wilderness around you. And you pass the skill challenge without too many issues. With these two out of the way, it is pretty quickly becoming midday to mid-afternoon. As you are traveling, you are making decent pace, so we can go ahead and start back at the top of the challenges if Clex you want to go again, or if somebody else wants to take a turn. I'll go again. I will do an acrobatics. In the event we come across, like, an obstacle, that is an 18. Okay. On an 18, you are able to climb various trees or up rock walls that may give you a clear vantage of the path ahead, and you are able to continue guiding your party through another success, uh, another positive outcome for the skill count, um, for the skill challenge. So that is two successes, one more for today's leg of the journey. All right, I'll go. That's a 17 survival. Yeah, that's still an easy pass. No negative encounters. And uh, with that survival check, just kind of describe maybe a little bit of, of Gron's survival background or, or some of the habits that he's picked up living in the wilds. Gron is really good at noticing where there are paths carved into nature, whether it's by other travelers or by animals. He can kind of find the quickest path through the wilderness by looking at who's been there before. Yeah, and you do this very adeptly, very seasoned. You've been doing this nearly your whole life. He also has a good sense of when it's time to actually stop and rest for the sake of endurance and when we need to hydrate and such. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'll even say we can count that towards a short rest. Absolutely. Let's see if I can I can beat my two hit points from yesterday. Oh, man. Oh, I doubled it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, man. Paper Wizard is made of paper. Paper Wizard is paper, and I've even got the D8 from my Cleric Diff. Yeah, Keeps coming up a one. Man, that sucks. Anyways, one left. Who would like to go before today's leg of the journey concludes? I think it's my turn. This is going to kind of be up to you, Andy, uh, and how I use either Arcana or History to sort of navigate this path uh, in case there are, like, any sort of uh, old, like, markings like runes like carved into the stone by the old sure. uh, you know flame speakers who live there i can sort of like use my knowledge to identify those markings to make sure we're on the right path sure um i'll say either one kind of fits that description um well enough so you can you can use either one of those and the, the check will be the same all right that's an 11 history 
I'll just go ahead and roll initiative now. <laughs> Andromeda, go ahead and roll a d8 for me. Five. Okay. This one is is not as stealthy or openly hostile, but anyone with a modest passive perception would begin to notice a large fleece-maned lion, this brilliant white mane uh, on this large lion, kind of not necessarily hunting your party, but keeping pace as you travel on this leg of your hike. It is maybe about 30 or 40 feet away. You can't really tell right now, but it has noticed you. What do the three of you do? Leonin can't talk to lions, right? I don't believe no. so. Oh, damn <laughs> no, but that's that's clever thinking. Do they do they have an understanding? Is there like a rapport? Do like do we get each other? You can try. <laughs> I don't like those <laughs> odds. <laughs> I'm going to lock eyes with it and sort of stomp to signal to it that I'm ready to fight if that's really the path it wants to take. Clix is going to go behind Gron. <laughs> just just to hide behind Gron. Do I think anything of this? Does it appear portentous in any way? Go ahead and give me either a religion or, oddly enough, animal handling, but I think you're going to go with religion. Check. I am. That's an eight. Okay. Just very generally, very loosely, you can identify that it's a fleece mane lion, which does carry some connotation of the myths and legends of old, they being a bit of a omen to budding adventurers or heroes throughout the wilds of Theros. But that is it. This one in particular, you get no real read or glean on or omen of any kind. But as Gron stomps the ground, you see this large creature start and immediately go from trying to be stealthy and generally weary to immediately pose startled and slightly intimidated. So what do the three of you do? It has not come any closer yet. I'd like to try and if if this thing is focused on Gron and I am hiding behind Gron, mm -hmm. I'd like to disguise self as Gron. Okay. And help intimidate it. Okay. So... Gron and Andromedy, you see Clix step behind, and Jeppy, what do you think Clix's casting of this pious gift from Phoenix, this disguised self, would look like? I would imagine that Clix has the robe over his body, and he sort of hunkers down and gets small, and then as he stands back up, reveals this new disguised form. Very cool. You do this, and as you stand back up, you don the beefy form of Gron as you have disguised self. Gron, go ahead and roll intimidation with advantage as Clix has given you this help as you suddenly see yourself standing next to you. Ugh. Is that what I look like? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you realize what Andromedy meant by questioning your bathing habits. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dirty 20. I Hell think. yeah. Nice. Hell yeah. Cool. You can see this lion start to back away slowly, uh, never turning around, still looking directly at now the two minotaurs, but just begin backing into the brush. Is this shithead gone? It is backing away. If you're letting it, it will continue to do so. I'll roll another wisdom save. Uh, it continues to be pretty frightened by the pair of these minotaurs, and it slinks away and disappears. I raise my hand to the other Gron, and then I realize that Clix doesn't know our secret handshake. Oh, Aww. <laughs> Aww. Wait, did you hope it was your friend? I don't know what I thought. I just kind of assumed that We'd be on the same page about I, that. I thought you were raising your hand to see if I would raise mine and it was a mirror. Uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> when Clix does this, do I, like, sense at all the influence of Phoenix? Ooh, that's a good question. Go ahead and roll... I mean, all of this god stuff is religion, so go ahead and roll religion. Okay. There's a good roll, 24. As he goes to cast Disguise Self, you definitely feel just the slightest hint 
of the work of the god of deception at play. Andromedy will note this. Clicks might detect a sort of sullen scowl crossing their face as this happens, and they will just continue on their path. Right. And if the lion is gone, Clix would prefer to saunter about the mountains and brush in a smaller form. But before doing so, turns to Gron and says, I guess being big has some benefits. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> roll, roll performance. With advantage. Oh, I love it. Oh, no, I got a nat 20 as a 23 um, total. I'll Gron, just you hear yourself talking back at you, and it freaks you the Ooh. fuck out. I hiss. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> you try to hiss, but you just moo. Yeah. <laughs> um, and with that, clicks will revert back to the, his normal form. Nice. Awesome. So we have one more. That is clicks round of the skill challenge okay i will uh i will do stealth to make sure that we stay well hidden from pesky lion assholes and the like for the next leg of our journey is that 19 125 25 holy shit yeah that's uh that's some great rolls making up no for... oh my god no nine <laughs> wait <laughs> Ten, what? Uh, what 15 <laughs> 15 oh, i thought it said thought it said 19 Jeffrey, for the sake of the edit, what the fuck happened there? <laughs> All right. So I rolled these die, and this one landed, like, here. Okay. And I looked, and I just saw the nine, and I thought there was a one next to it, because it was like this. And this little dash. Yeah. It's like a shadow from the yeah. book, is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Wait. 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 No. What? <laughs> that is a 19? I think it is. Should I just re-roll? It says 19. Oh my god, it says 19. We'll take the fucking 19, god damn it. Okay, 25. On a fucking 25, not only are you able to very expertly guide your party uh, stealthily away from not only that fleece mane lion, but other beasts that lie hiding as you continue ascending up these mountain passes, um, you are getting further and further into this mountainous, very rugged, very hostile terrain. You notice in the distance on a 25, something of a harpy's lair on a nearby mountainside and are able to very adeptly guide the party away uh, without being noticed by the very foul and nefarious looking harpies that fly in and out from that lair uh, perched up on a nearby mountainside. A great success. Pretty cool. With that, this day's leg of the journey draws to the close, and with four passes so far, Andromedy, perhaps positive outcomes considered, you would make it there by midday the next day. Sounds good. And I imagine, Gron, your instinct would, you know, lead you for your party to begin to make camp again, as, again, the evening sky leads into that of Nyx. Absolutely. I don't fuck with darkness, and I suggest that we make a camp as soon as it looks like the sun is approaching the horizon. Great. Also, you know, that 25 is, is very good, and so, since there aren't any more rolls uh, left today... I'll give the perception checks for this night's watch advantage instead. And so we can just go through some quick night's watch checks before concluding the rest of this journey. Who wants to go first? Gron, you all right taking first watch again? Sure. Okay. So those are going to be with advantage. Eight. Okay. With an eight, um, things seem pretty clear. <laughs> uh, until near the end of your watch, in a uh, nearby brush, you see a pair of glowing eyes staring back at you, maybe about 20 feet away from you. I try to discern what this thing is. Can I roll nature? Sure. That's an 11. You are unfamiliar on an 11. Doesn't seem hostile, but seems out of place. All right. I just... Fix my gaze on it. Okay. I'm going to make a little roll here. <laughs> These pair of eyes just stare at you the rest of your watch. 
unblinking. You've been at this now a couple of hours. You can tell that Andromeda is supposed to take watch soon, but these eyes are still staring at you. I'm going to approach the eyes. Okay. I don't think Andromeda would fare very well out here with whatever this is going to be. And so I'm just going to walk right up. Great. You walk towards, and you can now see that these eyes are less those of glowing pupils of night animals, and more very fine, burning cinders. As you approach, you see a large wolf-like beast jump out of the brush. But this is like no wolf that you have ever seen before. Its body is made of metal. And at its odd metallic seams, it seems to have bits of fire and magma holding it together, and its eyes, like burning cinders, stare directly at you as it growls. I immediately recklessly attack. Oh shit, okay. That's a crit. Alright, fuck. Go ahead and roll some damage. Oh god, Jimmy looks thrilled. That's 23 bludgeoning damage. Fuck. Come on. Uh, well, it, it was probably going to try and run away if you attacked it, but uh, it can't do that now. In the middle of this camp scene, you know, in the in the middle of the night, this anvil wrought wolf found your camp and was eyeing it, jumps out of the bushes, and its life is immediately ended as you just swiftly bring your man-sized maul down over the top of this beast and the fires extinguish and it is left in a heap of metal and rock with a deafening clang yeah i imagine that wakes both clicks and andromeda up what's what's going on what's going on nothing go back to sleep oh oh dear gone did i lose piety with Perforost. <laughs> Give me a religion check. Two. Oh shit, really? Yeah. I only roll good on attacks. Everything else is gonna be single digits. The three of you, upon seeing this scene and Andromeda immediately recognizing the consequences, hear a distant rumble of an erupting volcano. Huh? This was likely one of the shrine's guardians. It wasn't dangerous to us. It was watching me for a couple hours. It just watched. Yes, it is a guardian of the shrine. It is meant to keep watch, as you are keeping watch over our camp. It jumped out at me. I just, uh, you know, do what I do. Let me know when something important happens. Clicks a couple more biscuits in and then goes back to bed. So, so edgy, those biscuits. <laughs> so edgy. <laughs> Edgiest biscuits ever. Andromedy, just go ahead and give me a quick quick religion check that's a 24 religion you can definitely sense that perhaps not severe but definitely impactful gron has lost a bit of any favor that he or you all may have been trying to garner in passing into the realms of perforos perhaps not terribly strong but definitely there perforos i will say this is not overly attached to his creations Sometimes he destroys them himself, but it was a bit rude of you, and some measure of atonement may be required when we reach the shrine proper. Who's Perforos again? Uh, Perforos is the god of the forge, of fire and metal and things of that nature, and also, to a certain extent, of creation and reshaping of things. Oh. Uh. On that thought, Gron concludes his watch, leaving Andromeda to make the rest of theirs. Same thing. Uh, I'm going to find a nice place to lean and let Scully sort of do the aerial surveillance. Go for it. 13 perception. Okay. Clear watch. You can tell that further up the mountain, even at night, that inclement weather may be imminent. It's something that I think Andromeda definitely was used to while they were staying at the monastery, but maybe something that they kind of took for granted after they left. Other than that, your watch is uneventful. You still see, even on that roll, majority of the same figures in the sky in Nyx. And we go to the next day. 
Okay, okay. It's the next day, the final leg of this part of your journey. Who would like to make the first skill challenge? All I have left is sleight of hand and deception. And then I have survival, which is low. I'll do it. Alrighty. I'm gonna roll nature to keep us on course using the direction of the sun and pretty straightforward. Go for it. It's a sixteen. Okay, yeah, that's a pass. Uh, one more success. Gron, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe you haven't really been up this high in the mountains. You've done a lot of travel and a lot of surviving in mountainous terrain, but these paths are taking you straight up, you know, the various switchbacks and things. So I don't know if you've ever been this high up. I don't know how that makes you feel, but you feel, you feel accustomed to this. You feel like it is well within your wheelhouse as an outdoorsman of sorts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been all around what you'd consider the wastelands, basically every type of terrain outside of a polis. Maybe never this high up, but I've been in mountains before. Nice. So with one more success needed, you all definitely feel the very brisk mountaintop winds become more common. The air gets slightly thin, even at this modest elevation, and any trees or brush give way to sheer cliff face and the harsh stone elements of the mountains. I'll take this last one, if you'll allow me to use persuasion. As we're getting really high up, it's kind of been a long journey. I can tell that everyone's getting tired, and this last leg is certainly the most difficult. Uh, remind me why we're doing this again. So I'd like to use my abilities of, of rhetoric to sort of keep everyone's spirits up as we make this last leg of the journey, and even reassure everyone that Clothis is guiding us. We are fated to make it to the top of this mountain. We cannot fail because I rolled a 19, and that totals a 22. Nice. Putting those portents to use. I'm tired of failing these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Andromedy, finally getting a success here. Portents or not, a success is a success. And, you know, I imagine there's some quips or brief anecdotes you might tell about the teachings of Clothis along your journey. But very rhetorical indeed, you manage to keep the morale of the party afloat. And eventually, as the midday sun gleams through the sky above these mountains, you all come to a ridge, and you can see rows of towering columns forming a pathway that leads to an open-air temple of sorts. From an ornate stone well at the center of this scene, two streams, one of water and one of lava, pour out into pools, both of which have various statues rising up from them. You can see small stone buildings that dot the scene's perimeter, a handful of figures moving about the area, while others appear to be working at simple forges. Most importantly, meditating between the two pools, Andromeda you recognize to be Volkos, the flame speaker and your first mentor. A stout but strong-looking human man with a long, scruffy brown beard and a bald head, ornamented with red and bronze tattoos. As he meditates, his cupped hands appear to have molten rock and metal swirling about them. He looks up at the three of you approaching and speaks gruffly. The citadel has been sealed off, and so you have returned, seeking my aid and guidance. I think that's a good place to leave this session. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me, with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our Holy Avengers, Jake and May. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a Holy Avenger. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.